Coming up on iOS today, well, WWDC is well underway and there have been lots of announcements. So Rosemary Orchard and I cover the highlights, the big things you are going to want to check out. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Raycon. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for listeners, and here's what you've got to do to get it. Just go to buyraycon.com slash iOS. And this podcast is supported by AT&T Active Armor. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash activearmor for details. Wow. Hello. Hello there. Welcome. Welcome to iOS Today, the show where we cover all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, all the OSs that Apple has on offer. And folks, WWDC just happened. So this is the big episode. This is the episode where we cover many of those things that that, uh, took place. Now, there's a lot to cover. So uh, buckle in for what should be a pretty awesome show. By the way, I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Rosemary Orchard. Hello, Rosemary. How are you today? Oh, I am excited. Uh, So excited. I apparently strained a tendon in my wrist. Um, (laughs) But the good news is, is, uh, you know, I can just switch back to using an Apple Pencil and do all those quick notes now whenever I need to. And oh my God, was this an action-packed keynote. And uh, Apple poked fun at themselves, which was great. I always love it when they do that. Craig Federighi landed in a pond of water and then magically dried his socks and trousers and shoes like in milliseconds. It was it was magical. Loved it. it. There was a lot of fun stuff that happened. Of course, this was another uh, WWDC that didn't take place in uh, person. It was uh, sort of pre-recorded in many cases, and uh, the event got to happen kind of in segments. And because of that, they get to do lots of fun stuff, and it was really enjoyable. Uh, as many folks pointed out, it was definitely the Craig Federighi hour. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, that makes sense, given that he is head of software at Apple. And uh, WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Conference, is the conference that starts off with a keynote where Apple covers what's new in its software so that developers can make use of these new tools in their apps and elsewhere. Uh, So it was expected to be, as it always is, a very uh, software-laden show. But interestingly, according to Six Colors, uh, Jason Snell, um, I think it's it's more than 60% of WWDCs have included hardware announcements. So where the narrative, as far as I was concerned, was that WWDC is not a hardware announcement event, and so I always go into it not expecting hardware, more than half of WWDCs have included hardware announcements. So this one not including hardware announcements was in the minority, which was interesting. Uh, But as... I have just pointed out there were no hardware announcements at this WWDC, just lots of fun new software updates that uh, Rosemary and I were both pretty pumped about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I do apologize to anybody I deafened when they said shortcuts on the Mac. We're going to talk about (laughs) that a little bit in Shortcuts Corner, but oh my gosh, am I excited. And they've got so many great changes in iOS and iPadOS as well, which just make using our devices perhaps a little more unified um, and a, a better experience everywhere, I feel. I agree. So let's start right at the top here. Um, One of the the things that they talked about, and of course, it makes a lot of sense in our current uh, environment as people are uh, still in many places in lockdown and in others are just kind of coming out of their dens to start to take on the world again after being vaccinated. And uh, with that comes, you know, we've, we've been in this and we have connected in the ways that we've connected. And by 
having that be kind of part of what we've done, it opens our eyes to the limitations of the technology that we have. And Apple uh, seemed to want to address that along with what um, Leo Laporte pointed out while we were covering the show, which was that Apple is trying to uh, get parity with other uh, companies, be it Google, be it Zoom, be it Microsoft, these different companies that use these kinds of tools. Uh, Apple really had some announcements here that bring them in line with the other ones. And this is fantastic. So it starts with FaceTime. Uh, FaceTime, of course, is Apple's communication tool. Uh, it is FaceTime audio and FaceTime video. FaceTime audio is a, uh, a voice conversation that happens over IP, over the internet. So the audio fidelity is better. You can hear the person on the other line a lot better. Um, and then, of course, FaceTime video, which includes making video calls with your friends or family or whomever, the different contacts that you have. And uh, group FaceTime has been a thing for a while. But what has not been a thing for a while is this new feature called share play. Rosemary, do you want to explain what share play is? I mean, explaining what share play is, is kind of like asking people to explain chocolate. Um, it's, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's not just one thing, it's many things and they all seem to be really good. Basically, it's a way of letting app developers, including Apple, including people like Disney Plus, share stuff with each other so that you can experience it at the same time. So mm -hmm. this could be something like watching Ted Lasso together where you'll have like the FaceTime call on your phone or maybe your iPad, and then you'll actually be watching it on the TV, but then you're all watching it synchronized together. Now there are some services that already have this, like, you know, Plex, uh, Netflix and so on, but you have to do it inside of their app. Whereas the idea with SharePlay is you can do it from messages or FaceTime. Um, and it's not just watching things. It's also sharing documents with each other and uh, like screen sharing and things like that. And wow, I mean, like it's not just, you know, that you are, you're, you're sharing things and you're really experiencing them together and any app developer can put this in their app, which means, you know, everything is shareable um, mm -hmm. and you can actually genuinely experience it at the same time, which means, you know, doing things like sharing stuff with my grandmother and trying to explain things to her is suddenly going to become a lot easier. I try and do it in person whenever I can, obviously during the pandemic, that's been very, very difficult. So I have taken to actually rec doing screen recordings using um, the, the trackpad on my iPad to show her so that she can actually see where she needs to click, um, yes. which, you know, it, it works. Um, and she's got voiceover and so on. And, you know, I, I, I make screencasts. I can do this kind of thing without too much difficulty, but that is a very high bar for anybody else to try and do, even with built-in screen recording, like knowing that you need to go into the settings, into accessibility and increase your pointer size and add, say, like a red border to make it really easy for somebody to follow, things like that. It, it's it's very difficult for people. And I think this is going to make it much easier to do it in real time and to experience lots of things in real time and share stuff. Because I know your family, you know, the fact that you are, you, you're vaccinated now is great, but you can't just pop around the corner and see them, Micah. They right. are- 24 hours away. Um, and so, you know, I think you're probably going to appreciate all this stuff as well. I mean, my family is a lot closer, 45 minutes drive or so uh, for most of them. But still, you know, if my grandmother has a problem with something or, you know, I just want to share something with her, but, you know, I don't want to necessarily go all the way over there and then drive all the way back after work. Um, you know, this way we can still experience things together and I'll actually get a bit more family time um, through technology, which I think is great. And I think it's very clever the way that Apple is doing this. So instead of one person, one account kind of being the hub uh, that, so say, you know, I place the call and I want to watch something, um, instead of my account then being the thing that streams the video or the audio or what have you to the other phones, um, the way that Apple's doing it is every single device is opening it up on its own device. And the only thing that's sort of linked is the, the, the time code or the sync. The only thing that's linked is the sync, uh, S Y N C. And so 
that is going to reduce latency, which is really nice so that you all genuinely are watching at the same time. And it doesn't have to reduce the, the quality of the video or whatever it is uh, as much because it'll rely on your local connection to do that. So I think that's a, a brilliant way of doing it versus being both the one kind of placing the call and streaming out whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, listening to music together and saying, oh my gosh, you're not going to, you're going to lose your mind at these drums that are about to happen. Uh, and the, one of the examples they showed in the uh, Kina or excuse me, in the developer session was a whiteboard where you and your team could collaborate together or friends whom, you know, you could be playing hangman or something, uh, whatever it happens to be, you can collaborate together on a whiteboard. And so, yeah, thinking of everybody uh, taking advantage of this, share play system in different ways is really cool. I mean, playing board games together, uh, digital board games together would be fantastic. I'm, I'm starting to think of, you know, uh, D and D campaigns that could take place over FaceTime with a virtual tabletop, uh, because of this. So a really cool thing, uh, there, uh, FaceTime got some other updates that we can briefly touch on, including um, a big word you're going to hear or a big phrase you're going to hear uh, going forward is spatial audio. Apple is super into this spatial audio concept. And one of these examples um, is in FaceTime, they've introduced spatial audio and some other audio kind of filtering effects where if you're having a FaceTime group call with several people, then it will kind of put them all in virtual space around you. So their voices won't all be kind of overlapping on the stereo that you're hearing. And instead, it's going to kind of, you know, uh, Uncle Leon is over here and Cousin Lindsay is over here and uh, Rosemary is in front of you. And in virtual audio space, that's how they'll kind of be mapped. So it helps to uh, be able to hear the conversation better rather than everybody talking all at once and it all sounding like it's all layered over the top of one another. Um, it's one of those things that you really have to try to understand how it works. Um, so some of those spatial audio features you can check out with Apple Music as spatial audio rolled out on Apple Music. Um, uh, earlier this week. Then um, grid view. So with grid view, instead of those silly floating tiles, I, I that's a little editorialization for me, but um, the floating tiles, you can stop that and just have everybody show up equally as um, a, a tile on your screen, which is quite nice. Um, portrait mode, which is Apple kind of getting in line is, again with the other uh, video conferencing platforms, except it can use the really nice uh, portrait mode technology in your device to provide portrait mode. So your background gets blurred and you are the one in focus. Um, with that, uh, I, I'd be curious to see if Apple starts there and then eventually adds virtual backgrounds because those are pretty popular. Um, and then mic modes, which with mic modes, um, I thought this was a, a clever use of all of the audio processing that Apple has been working on for quite some time, including um, two different modes aside from the standard mode. One is called voice isolation and one is called wide spectrum. For voice isolation, if you're in kind of a noisy space, then the way that they showed it was uh, somebody was in a room and there was somebody outside with a leaf blower who came indoors with a leaf blower and they turned on voice isolation mode and it just focused the audio on the voice so that you could be heard and hear clearly. And then wide spectrum, which is uh, the complete opposite. It is opening up the microphone to listen to as much as possible. So reducing filtering as much as possible so that if you were playing a concert or if you were, uh, an example that they gave is uh, FaceTime calls for um, music lessons, then you'd be able to hear things without that crushing of, uh, of the audio. And then I think a big one uh, is... FaceTime links. So this is something that I know people have wanted for a long time and have been sort of talking about for a long time. It's not quite FaceTime opening up its tech, Apple opening up its FaceTime technology to everybody, but it is providing access more so than it ever has. With FaceTime links, you can send a link to someone and even if they don't have an iOS or macOS or iPadOS device, they so if they're on Android or they're on Microsoft, they can click the link and it'll open up a browser. And in that browser, they can participate in the FaceTime call without having to log in. So uh, that's a pretty big deal, right? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Because 
one of the the frequent complaints I hear about both iMessage and FaceTime and for FaceTime at the very least, it's going away is that you, you know, it's, it's only people in the Apple ecosystem. Um, and you know, Apple, you know, fair enough, they can do what they like with this, but I think it is, you know, very good that FaceTime at the very least is going to be available to everyone. Um, just because, you know, that way you can just say, okay, yeah, we're going to use FaceTime for this. Um, and not have to think about, oh yeah, but there's this one person who's on Android, um, and things like that. They will still be able to join. Um, and it, as far as I can tell, it should work in their browser, hopefully perfectly. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'm 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 glad to see that that is a thing. I kind of feel like that is maybe an Easter egg they could have rolled out six months ago. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, Apple Apple didn't just start working on this like last June. Like they tend, they probably have a, a longer term plan for these things. And something like you know, I mean, we saw this with the pandemic and lots of web services. You know, people having to seriously amp up the the number of servers and things that they had available and make sure that you know, stuff didn't go down. The first couple of weeks of the pandemic, I know it was, um, uh, you know, crazy. The number of times I would try to get into a meeting link and it'd be like, yeah, this is broken at the moment. And it's like, okay, uh, okay, people. So can we switch from go to meeting to Zoom for this one, please? Uh, so we had like <laughs> three or four different services running um, and yeah, it was crazy. Nobody knew who was doing what. Uh, and I think FaceTime, you know, it's, it's good that they're joining this and let's face it, you know, we're not going to stop doing stuff remotely now. Just, you know, we've, we figured out how all this stuff works now. Um, Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So and why not take many, advantage uh, of it? Exactly. And many a person are saying, we don't really want to go back to the office. So uh, yeah. I think we'll continue to see that. Um, that covers FaceTime. That was the first kind of big update. The next one comes uh, in messages, which uh, Apple has lumped in with Memoji. So we'll quickly, quickly brief on Memoji. Um, there are new outfits that you can choose for your Memoji. So that way, you know, you can, uh, it, it brings it more in line with Bitmoji from Snapchat, where it's not just your uh, face, but also the clothes that you're wearing. Um, there are new styles of um, headwear and you can change the colors of them. And then some great, uh, we talked about these a little bit ahead of time because Apple announced this as part of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, new accessibility customizations, including cochlear implants, oxygen tubes, and soft helmets. So more customization than they've had in the past. Uh, more hairstyles, which for me was one that I uh, complained about because uh, I can create my bitmoji character i've you know sent it to different people in conversations and i always get the feedback oh my god that looks exactly like you which is a really good feeling with my my memoji character my memoji character i don't feel like it looks like me very much at all um i still am wanting them to work on head length because i have a longer face uh than the memoji characters they're really kind of squished and also the hairstyles don't ever quite uh match mine because as a person of, uh, as, as a mixed race person, I have mixed race hair. It's halfway between my white side and halfway between my black side. And so those come together to make kind of a unique hairstyle. And so it's hard to get like my type of curl in the hairstyles that are available. And look, Memoji, ultimately not that important, but you do want to feel represented if you know these tools are available. And so it's kind of a bummer when it's not. So I typically have a pink hat on my Memoji, and that's how I uh, get past that feeling of uh, not being included there. Uh, but bigger than that uh, are the changes in messages. So messages kind of focused on this new uh, tool called Shared With You. And I think this is a big feature because I don't know about you, Rosemary, but I get a lot of text messages over the course of you know a week, and uh, lots of times it's links and and uh, music and videos and photos and all sorts of stuff to check out from friends and family members and colleagues. And I can lose. Oh, and also for myself, I send myself links, and I lose that stuff in the noise. You know what I mean? And so with shared with you, Apple is trying to address that. So. If you get links, images, uh, news articles, photos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in your messages, then shared with you is tied into that. And it can start showing you that content in the different apps that correspond to the message that was sent. So for example, 
someone sends you a Safari link, then when you open Safari, you can see a shared with you section with links there that you might want to tap on. In uh, Photos, then when you open the Photos app, it can show you photos that have been shared with you in its own unique album. Uh, someone sends you an Apple TV link, uh, then when you open the uh, TV app, it will show you the videos, the, the television shows of the movies that someone shared with you. So it's a really nice way to keep up to date with uh, what is what has been shared with you so that you don't have that friend going, every time I share a link with you, I never get any response, which is something that I may or may not have heard, not from friends, but certainly from family. Um, so yeah, it's good to have that reminder to be a, to have that address. And as a person with ADHD, and I don't say this jokingly, um, sincerely, this feature is incredibly helpful to me uh, because it is not that I don't want to respond to different people who send me different things. It is that I move on to a new task and that one just completely falls from my mind. And so having those contextual reminders of it, then I can go, oh, I've got this downtime right now. I'd love to check this out. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty pumped about that. And then the last thing, uh, Rosemary, I'm pretty pumped about this is photo collections. So right now, if I sent you eight photos, they'd go zoop, 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 zoop. And there'd just be this giant stack of photos that you have to scroll through uh, in... Oh, I shouldn't say right now because I am running the beta. So, uh, and Same. you are too, I know. So if I sent them to you, they'd show up in this new way, which is as a collage or a stack of images that you can swipe through. And in fact, let me just uh, find some photos I can send to you right quick uh, so that we can show this. I'm trying to think here of some photos that would work. Ah, I went to Quite Tower recently. So I will send you some photos of Coit Tower, photos from the top of Coit Tower. For folks who don't know, Coit Tower is this really awesome place in San Francisco that um, overlooks the entirety of uh, San Francisco. You can kind of see a, a 360 degree view of San Francisco. It's a really, really neat place. And they've got uh, these beautiful murals inside. Um, that uh, have been painted and uh, you take this 90 year old elevator up to the top uh, and it's really kind of cool. Ah, and Rosemary has also sent me some photos. So I'll switch over to the iPhone here and you can see the photos that I sent to her um, are right here. And then the ones she sent to me are right here. There are five photos. I can tap and swipe through these. <laughs> Popcorn, uh, mm -hmm. Tesla. And yeah, some Tesla sort in a of shopping mall. Ice cream. Some some sort of ice cream treat. And then if I tap at the top right, I can switch this to gallery view and see uh, the different photos that are available here. So I'll tap back. And then there's the stack that I sent to Rosemary. And I also love this new little uh, button here to the right, which is a download button. And if someone sends yeah. you video or photos, you can easily tap that and download uh, the content. So there's mine. Um, oh, there's a little plus down here at the bottom right. I wonder what that does. Oh, that's how you uh, issue a tap back there. And then I could reply directly to that stack or uh, share that stack out as I wanted to as well. Um, so yeah, that is the new photo collection feature, which is quite nice uh, in yeah. iOS. Yeah, uh, I do just want to take a moment to say, because uh, we've already been asked in the chat room. Um, and as I was playing with this, I'm just going to switch to my iPad. And I went to this view and I went, yeah, I'll tap the gallery option. The first eight times I tapped the gallery option, it did not work. So just for people who are thinking, yeah, I'm going to get on beta one. If you're not a developer or you don't you know, need to be doing what Micah and I are doing right now, don't do it just yet. Wait, wait for the public beta. They've got, they've got some kinks to iron out. Some stuff just doesn't work very well the yet. Biggest, but it, it, as you pointed out, Rosemary, the biggest concern is data loss. And so for us, I'm sure you, I have like three different backups in three different places oh, yeah. of my um, iOS device before I upgraded for that specific reason. Um, if, you know, there are phone calls that you might miss through this, uh, all sorts of things that can be an issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, and this is part of the reason why you tune into the show is so that we can go forth and do this stuff so you can check it out. And then when the public beta comes out, totally take part in that if you want to, or uh, hold out until the it finally happens. Because... There's also issues of uh, if your phone gets bricked and then you have to fix that. I had an issue uh, 
not with this beta, but with the iOS 14 beta, or excuse me, the iPad OS 14 beta that bricked my iPad. And it the normal process that I would do to fix the bricking was not working. And I had to do a bunch of research to figure out how to fix it without having to send it into Apple. So yeah. And because of all of that, I'm curious, Rosemary, if you did this, I did not upgrade my watch to the watch OS beta, because if you do and it bricks it, you have to send it into Apple. Did you upgrade? I did. I mean, I have a developer account. I am a developer. Um, And um, okay. So for people at home, there will be a public watch OS beta. Consider this my personal piece of advice to you. If you like battery life on your Apple watch, don't do the upgrade. Just wait (laughs) until it's a public release. Just wait. September is not that far away. Uh, I have to charge my watch three times a day right now. Um, oh and it's word. Still, um, and like, I usually wear it all the time for like sleep tracking and stuff. And I'm actually kind of like, ah, you know, maybe I should just buy a second Apple watch and not upgrade it to the beta. But what yeah. series, uh, what series do you have? Uh, this is uh, whatever the latest is. We're on series six oh, wow. now, I think. Yeah, series yeah, six. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Um, and also just Nick is asking in, uh, the, uh, discord, uh, if the stack works in SMS as well, uh, Nick, I don't think the stack is going to work in SMS. It might show up as a stack. Uh, but the other person at the other end is not going to see it as a stack because MMS, which is how you, yeah. MMS, which is how you see, how you send messages through the SMS system, it, it's a multimedia message instead of a, a text-based message. Um, that I'm that just doesn't have the features this. iMessage has. Um, and yeah. I know I actually can't send MMS. I've disabled it because it costs me like 50p per photo that I send. Um, so I've just disabled that entirely. And I also don't have any green bubble. I'm going to try so sending on. myself um, a photo from my um, Google, my Pixel, um, just uh-huh. to see... I mean, if I have my Nokia I right here, but I uh, don't have a way to send these to myself. And yes, as you pointed out, um, it's not going to, of course, show on their side. It'll show on their side, however it shows. But it is, I am curious if an MMS conversation will show up as uh, the way. So I'm sending some photos here as MMS. And I don't want to schedule a send. Oh, oops. Yeah, I thought that this had um, a way to do this via Google Voice, essentially, but I don't think it does. I don't have um, a phone number tied to this right now, so I don't think I can actually do that now that I think about it. Oops. Uh, yeah, we'll have to come back to that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to address that, so we'll see uh, if it shows up. My thought is that why wouldn't it um, on yeah, your Yeah, I think end, it'll show end, up on an iOS device like this. Uh, yeah. But if you're sending them to an iOS device, then please get the other person to turn iMessage on. Um, and uh, I've also just been asked in the chat room about, wait, MMS aren't included in your plans in the UK? SMS and MMS aren't? Uh, if you have a like a contract with the, the phone company, then yeah, you get unlimited SMS, but I don't think you get MMS. Like everywhere here, like everyone is using either iMessage, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, one of those. Um, so, you know, you never send stuff through the cellular provider pretty much. It's only phone calls that go that way. All right. Up next is a big one. Um, and Rosemary, I was hoping you could talk about this because I feel... Uh, oh, and actually up next, we're going to talk about focus uh, and all the new fun focus things. But we should take a quick break before we cover that. So uh, Rosemary will take charge right after these messages uh, because I want to tell you about our pals at Raycon. You may have heard of Raycon before. Yeah, Raycon is the excellent way to listen to all sorts of audio, whether it's for work or for play. A lot of us are going to be on the move again this summer. So my advice, take your Raycons with you. Whether you're catching up on your favorite podcast, binging an audiobook, or listening to music, a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears can make all the difference. You get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons look great and feel even better, truly. They come in a range of cool colors and with customizable gel tips included, you get a nice, comfortable in-ear fit. Raycons are built to go wherever you go, 
with quick and seamless Bluetooth pairing and a compact charging case. The, the charging case is so awesome. It's just this tiny little thing. You can just drop it in your bag, stick it in your pocket. It's really great. And with enough battery life for six hours of playtime on a single charge, those everyday earbuds will get you 24 hours of battery life with the uh, charging case. These things are so cool. My favorite um, thing about the uh, earbuds is that when you uh, open up the box, they include so many different ear tips, so many different ear tips, so you can get the perfect fit. And then because of the design, they fit within that space in your ear. Uh, piercers know the name of that space. I do not. But uh, it's yeah, there that that photo there shows you if you're watching um, how nice it kind of just fits in that space in the ear. So if you are, um, you know, not wanting to have the the stem sticking down or these different parts sticking out or what have you, uh, Raycon they're just so light and svelte. I really think they're great. And like I said, with those customizable ear tips that so many different sizes, just you can find what exactly perfectly fits for you for the most comfort and uh, placement. So listen up, Raycon's offering 15% off all of their products for our listeners. And here's what you've got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash iOS. There you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal. You'll want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash iOS. Thanks so much, Raycon. Just head to buyraycon.com slash iOS to check it out. And uh, Rosemary Orchard, why don't you tell us about Focus on iOS 15? It's not just on iOS 15. It's also on iPad OS 15, which is where I'm going to show it off. Um, but for people who are going, wait, what on earth is Focus? You remember Do Not Disturb. Then you remember the Do Not Disturb while driving that we got. And then you remember Sleep Mode, which we got last year. These are all kind of variants of the same thing. They are Do Not Disturb with a little bit extra added on. Well, Apple has realized we like this kind of thing. People are using D&D while driving for, you know, other things than driving just because they wanted to, you know, have an auto response to somebody that says, hey, like, if it's urgent, you know, send the word urgent back and then I'll get it. But, you know, other than that, I, I, I don't want to be bothered. Well, we can now add multiple focus modes so that we can, sh you know, focus on everything. And so just for uh, demonstration purposes, I've got one, two, three, four, five. These are my custom ones, which I've created here. Um, so you can create five custom ones. There's also a default do not disturb. There's do not disturb while driving. There's sleep and work and personal. Um, and by default, this syncs across your devices. So previously, Apple Watch and, and your iPhone would sync with each other. So, you know, if you turn on Do Not Disturb on your Apple Watch, unless you disabled it, it would turn it on on your iPhone as well. Well, now, at the start of the show, I turned on Do Not Disturb on my iPad. All of my devices went into Do Not Disturb. And why say all of my devices? I mean, everything running iOS 15 and macOS Monterey went into Do Not Disturb. So if you upgrade all your devices when you put Do Not Disturb or a focus mode on, then you're you're just away. Like it, it's it's set for everyone, which is great. Um, so I uh, am loving this to start with because there are so many different things. So I'm just going to pop open uh, the work one um, as an example. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do here. So to start with, you can choose to allow certain people to send you notifications and you can choose a very long list if you want, or you can choose a really short list. You can also choose just a couple of apps to can send you notifications. So if you want to add lots of apps, so for example, if I want the app store and the Apple store to be able to send me notifications as well as the clock think there's a bug here because the clock is appearing on my screen twice. <laughs> um, and uh, Civ 6 is in the middle of that. But okay, uh, fantastic. I'll find my, those are all good. I will get to an extra find my notification in a little bit. Um, so I'll have those uh, apps able to send me notifications, but nothing else while I'm working. Um, then you can also choose after this time sensitive notifications. So this means that if somebody sends you something, it's very urgent, then they can respond and say, hey, it's urgent. Um, and this ties in a little bit with sharing the focus status. So this means, say Micah is messaging me while I'm at my day job and I've got this work mode enabled. You'll see Micah's little profile picture isn't up here under people at the moment. Um, and that means, you know, he, he 
isn't going to be able to break through that. Well, if I have share focus status on, that means that he can tap on an iMessage and just have it send me a notification anyway and be like, Rose, this is amazing. Like, you know, Tim Cook has just announced that you're going to be the next CEO of Apple. Like, what did you interview for this? Uh, spoiler, <laughs> that's not actually happening. Just, well, just to be clear. As of yet. Uh, I wish. I, I wish. Um, so, you know, that this is pretty amazing. Um, and then after this, we've got some customization options. And this is where things get super nerdy in the best possible way. So for those of you who are aware, you've got multiple home screens on your iPad and um, a little problem in that my uh, iPad is not swiping between home screens. Gotta love this beta life. Anyway, pretending I was swiping between multiple home screens, you would know I do have multiple home screens and I can choose specific pages. Here, here we go. Here are all my home screens. So I could just choose this page here and this page here as my two work home screens. Um, and then when this focus mode is enabled, I just see those home screens. It doesn't delete any other apps off my iPad. I can have the same app on multiple pages. So if, for example, um, you use the mail app for work mail and personal mail, then you can put the mail app on your personal home screen and your work home screen and just switch between the two, um, which is great. There's also um, some more options as well. Um, which um, are the ability to dim the lock screen. So for people who who uh, have tried this before, and oh, there we go. I can't open notification center. There we go. So uh, notification center, it would be dimmed. Uh, that's not showing up because A, beta, B, I'm plugged in and uh, using this. Um, you can also have delayed delivery where you'll see up here, upcoming while in do not disturb. A couple of people sent me messages, including David Sparks and Matthew Castellini. I should probably reply to them um, about things. Um, you know, that's gone straight into my notification center. There's also the option to hide notification badges. So that means, you know, if, if we look down here in my doc, uh, Gmail, OmniFocus and messages all have three or four notifications. With this turned on, when I'm in this mode, I'm just using regular do not disturb at the moment, um, then, you know, you, you don't see those basically. So it's not going to distract you. There's also some smart activation options, which is having um, this focus mode turn on at a certain time certain location or when you open a certain app. So if you always open um, a specific app, like when you start work or something, then you could use that to trigger this. Uh, a really good example for this is if you use a specific two-factor authentication application to log into work, have the focus mode trigger when, when you start that. Um, and then, you know, what? even if you've got flexible working hours, then you'll be right. Uh, you'll be good. Um, the other option here is smart activation, which is basically Apple is using the Siri technology built into it, your device and on device learning to go, oh, hey, it seems like you're activating uh, the work focus mode at, you know, kind of these times, these locations with these apps, stuff like this. And it tries to figure it all out for you. Um, and then, you know, if you have this on, it should automatically turn on smart, you know, turn on this, this focus mode for you, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it goes further, Micah. It goes further. Yeah, Am I allowed to get a little nerdy with shortcuts here? A thousand percent. Oh, thank you. you. Wouldn't have it any okay. other way. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, people who've played with shortcuts, specifically in the automation section before, will be aware that you can have shortcuts run when Do Not Disturb turns on. But every individual focus mode can run a shortcut. Um, and this is pretty amazing for many reasons because when this when this runs it can run entirely automatically you can turn off this ask before running and say don't ask me which means on a mac say running mac os monterey i'm sitting there and it's like okay presentation time so i turn on my presentation mode which turns off notifications from almost everything that syncs across my devices and it can run shortcuts on your ipad and your iphone at the same time so you can have this do amazing things in the background for you, like, you know, start a time tracker or stop a time tracker, um, you know, send a message to your, your partner to say, hey, uh, I'm in a presentation, please, you know, don't message me the dog pics because I'm just going to go, oh my God, the dogs are cute um, or whatever it is, you know, whatever is important in your life. Uh, you could, you know, say that when you end the particular focus mode, do a Starbucks order for coffee. Uh, because that means that you're leaving, you, you know, you're leaving home um, and you and you're going to be driving to work and you're going to want to, you know, get a coffee on your way or something. Um, and um, you can also have shortcuts 
turn on focus modes. So that means you can use things like NFC tags or um, other things to to trigger this, which aren't necessarily time based. So if you usually clock in at work and or you use a badge system to get into the building, when you tap your phone against your work badge, then that can run a shortcut because that's an NFC tag. Um, and I mean, this is great because I mean, imagine you um, you have a focus mode. Um, so I'll create a personal automation right here a moment. Uh, so when I enable my work focus mode, okay, when I turn it on, then I would like to split screen between, uh, I'm going to select uh, drafts because this is one of my favorite apps and the Apple store. Okay. And if I run this, then I have drafts and the Apple store. And you can have that run every time you turn on your work focus mode or whatever it is that you need. I mean, you probably don't want drafts in the Apple store unless you spend your day buying Apple laptops, in which case, hi, uh, you have a new best friend. Um, but this is incredible. You can set it up to really make your devices do magic for you um, and help you stay on track with things. Um, I personally, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying lots of different home screens on my phone. Uh, I have more home screens right now than I have had since the app library came into existence because I'm trying one for each focus mode. Uh, I renamed them all to one. To, I renamed them all to one to five uh, today uh, so that I could show people. So you can add five custom uh, focus modes on top of the five already existing ones. Um, I'm just going to um, delete uh, focus mode one. It's fine. I, I've created a blank one and show you. So if you create a custom one, then it shows you that you can create ones for fitness, gaming, or reading. Um, and if you tap on this, then it will, you know, give you some suggestions, like it'll turn it on automatically when you start a workout with fitness plus or in your Apple watch, which is nice reading, have it turn on when you open the app to open an app to read. So for example, when you open the Kindle app or the books app uh, and gaming, um, you could say when you connect to a wireless gaming controller, that's a, a good one. Or you can say custom where you can input your own name, select a color and pick an emoji. So walking the dog, for example, uh, I don't actually have a dog. Maybe I need one. Um, uh, but then, you know, then you select which contacts you want to allow through, or you can say allow none which apps you want to allow to notify you. So for example, uh, it's always important to let the clock notify me. That bug is still there. Sometimes these things go away between one screen load and the next. Um, and whether or not to allow time sensitive notifications and boom, that's it. Just done. Um, and it automatically goes to sharing across devices. You can say which apps can see your focus status, whether or not you want auto reply enabled. Uh, what should happen with phone calls, uh, if phone calls from everyone should go through, um, or if it's just repeated calls, or if there's a particular groups. Uh, I have a group called Birthday Reminders, uh, which I basically, people I always want to talk to. Um, and so yeah, I could select that. Um, you know, this is great. And focus mode, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm really interested in here is seeing what everybody else does with this. Because mm -hmm. like the custom home screens, like a home screen for work and a home screen for not working, that is the first logical thing. I do not want to see Outlook or Teams or Azure when I'm not working. Um, but when I am working, those are what I want shoved in my face to remind me every single time I pick up my phone, hey, Rose, you, you know, you're actually supposed to be working. It's okay to send a quick reply to somebody about this, um, but you know, you're know, you working. Uh, so here's your list of things to do. Here's your calendar for today. Get on with it. Um, and that is just great, just having that happen automatically without me needing to think about it. Agreed. Um, yeah, focus mode is going to be incredibly powerful. Uh, I am interested to see, like you said, how people are going to be making use of that uh, over time. And the idea that uh, developers can tie into your focus mode uh, to share status, I thought was a really neat thing. So Slack could eventually... Um, and that was the example that they showed, you know, pull that information. And so in Slack, people would know uh, that you are in work focus mode or what have you. And those can be kind of translated between. So you could essentially say, when I'm in focus mode on iOS, uh, update my Slack status to that or update my, um, my Discord status to that too. I think that's a neat, neat, neat thing. Yes. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, usually betas are kind of buggy and things don't work. And I'm not saying this is not buggy. There are plenty of things that don't work. But the one thing I've seen that be rock solid so far, and I hope this doesn't break in any betas, is the syncing between devices. I turn a status on 
and it's it's just everywhere. Um, and it's great. Like this is one of the things that may force me uh, to upgrade my production machine sooner rather than later to the Monterey beta. So uh, Micah, in advance, if you, if you want to put your name down to kill me and be at the top, I would suggest now is probably a good time. Um, I will hold out for as long as I can, but oh my gosh, this sinking, like I just do it and it's done. And that that is just such a killer feature. I mean, especially for me, I spend a lot of time podcasting and screencasting. I want it to happen, but you spend a lot of time podcasting as well. I bet you would love it to happen. People who spend a lot of their day in meetings and then out of mm-hmm. meetings, they immediately need to know if the phone's ringing or something, you know, just having it sync across your devices, that that is absolutely critical to making this work. And it's brilliant and it's solid. I am so impressed with that. Um, so really, you know, hugely impressed by Apple. Definitely. All right. Uh, the next section is maps, and we'll briefly cover that because there's not a whole lot of new stuff. Um, for one, they updated the city experiences in certain places. I'm sure they'll add more over time. Uh, but San Francisco was the example that they gave, which makes sense given uh, Apple's proximity. Uh, so it's a new 3D view that is quite detailed. Uh, and zooming in, you can really see kind of the, the height and structure and depth of everything. Uh, there's the the ferry building in San Francisco, which is fun. Um, there are some new driving features that I think are important. Uh, it better tells you about uh, turning lanes and shows you where crosswalks are and bike lanes are. And as you kind of go through complex uh, portions, it gives you even more information about which lane you should be in, uh, what lane does what and helps you uh, navigate a little bit better, which in California is quite nice as there are loads of different complex uh, intersections and interchanges um, that are all over the place. So I am looking forward to that. Um, Walking directions are getting one of those features that folks have wanted for a long time with the advent of augmented reality. They've always talked about this uh, augmented reality view being an important thing. So um, a lot of times when someone's in a city uh, with tall buildings and um, other stuff that gets in the way, then GPS can fail you sometimes and you have trouble getting a connection and and seeing where you are in relation to everything else. So augmented reality is meant to come in and sort of bridge that gap. So with this new um, step-by-step direction feature, you can hold up your phone and sort of scan across and then the uh, the app will recognize where you are and provide a view in augmented reality to tell you where you need to go so that you can figure out right where you are and where you are, are supposed to go next. And then there are some new transit features as well. Um, it says that it shows nearby stations and transit times and then also lets you pin your favorite routes. So that's a, a quick look at some of the stuff coming to maps. But um, let's move on to Safari because... Uh, There have already been some thoughts about the new Safari, um, and I am having to relearn uh, Safari for sure because muscle memory has me wanting to go to the top of the screen, and on iPad, it is at the top of the screen. Yeah, um, yeah. it is, but then a tab is also my search bar, and this is kind of breaking my brain, Micah. So, you know, I I go to say twit.tv here, and this is the address bar and so on, and I can search here or type an address, but it's also the tab bar and it's moving around and it changes colors. And I don't know, I'm, I both like it and I dislike it. Um, yeah. it's, it's a little it's strange a huge and, change. Yeah. And uh, like, I feel like I've lost some buttons here. Um, so if I, uh, you know, if I tap and hold on the plus, then I don't get the option to see all of my tabs anymore. I have to go over to the side and then tabs, um, and then I can get rid of one. Um, and you know, I can create them again. Um, and, uh, that image is ready for later. It's an important part of the show. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good, but on iPhone, it is so different because, uh, when I open, uh, something on my iPhone, I'm just, uh, switching to that right oh, there. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, then, uh, you know, I've, I've now got this, this address bar at the bottom, the bottom. (laughs) Uh, and 
this is good, but it means that everything is further up the screen. So if I go to say the Twit website, um, and you know, this is nothing is wrong with these websites. Uh, it's just that this menu bar is even further at the top than it was before. So especially for me, I've got a Mac's iPhone. Okay. And, uh, I'm, uh, my phone is behind my phone. This is very confusing for people who are watching the video. Like I have to stretch my, th- like I have to move my hand. Like I can't, yeah, I literally can't, I can barely stretch that far. If I do, I'm going to drop my iPhone. Like this phone is not providing, this hand is not providing support. Even when like my hand is like nicely balanced, like here, it's it still feels quite precarious mm-hmm. doing that. So I don't know. Um, like there's advantages and disadvantages. This I can see why they've done it because especially for people like me with thousands and thousands and thousands of tabs. Yes, I have them close automatically. I still end up with millions of them because <laughs> I have a shortcut on my home screen, um, which automatically opens DuckDuckGo so that I don't get distracted by the previous thing that I was looking at every time I open Safari to Google something. Um, but, you know, so th- from that perspective, it's it's good. From the other perspective, I don't know. It's just a little bit weird. Um, and uh, they've hidden some buttons as well. Um, so uh, I can't reload quite as easily, which when you've been having internet outages is definitely interesting. But hey, uh, it does seem to be working uh, overall. It's just going to be a bit of an adjustment to get used to it, I guess. Yeah. Um, on It's weird that it's also on, Mac, on the Mac, uh, on Mac OS. I... It feels more odd there than anywhere because it's almost like, why does it need to be on the Mac? Um, it feels like a very iOS feature with these, you know, sort of touchable areas. Um, the one feature that I liked from Safari especially was the tab groups feature. Uh, so instead of, because what I end up doing is I do a lot of my browsing on my Mac, not on um on iOS and iPad OS, it's like in the moment browsing where I need to learn something right quick or uh, am looking up something in the moment. But on Mac, that's kind of where research tabs take place. So I'll open up multiple tabs and go through them and look at different things. And so what I've done anytime I've needed to restart my computer or do something else where the browser needs to be closed is there's a feature where I just click uh, bookmarks and then I choose add bookmarks for these seven tabs. And so I've got folders that are all the different bookmarks from different times and dates. So I just use a text expander uh, shortcut to pop in the time and date, and then I can easily go and find what I was missing and open up those tabs again. In uh, iOS 15, iPadOS, and macOS, um, there's now tab groups. So when you're doing that kind of research, you can say, you can give that group of tabs a title. Uh, So I would still use the same kind of title. And then it's easy to open those up across different apps. So they sync between your devices and you can access them anywhere. I think that's fantastic. Um, The other thing in uh, Safari across the different systems is extensions. So you could already have extensions in Safari on the Mac. On iOS, not so much. The extensions uh, were content blockers. And so in the Safari settings in your on your iOS device or iPadOS device, you could turn on and off content blockers. Now they're giving you the ability to add even more Safari extensions. And we saw an early example, or I saw an early example of this uh, from one developer who makes a uh, data jar and uh, they were uh, showing off a custom CSS uh, extension. So they were on their phone and had typed in some different you know, rules for CSS. And so it would change the page according to what they had set. So it's really interesting seeing some of these early extensions. Apple on stage announced uh, or talked about Grammarly, uh, which is a popular tool that... Um, that people use. I think they were a sponsor, if I'm not mistaken, at one point. Um, Honey, which is uh, a tool that helps you save money and some others that they showed off that will help you save different uh, different things on your uh, device. So yeah, there are going to be some early extensions available in Safari on the iPhone and iPad OS. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things we actually talked about this a little bit last week, uh, because uh, one password was nominated for the inclusivity award. It didn't win. um, But the developers we mentioned are kind of like amazing and that they always have stuff on day one of WWDC. And so this is actually one of their developers has already got a one password extension for Safari. 
And this is on the iPad. This isn't a Mac that he's using here. It looks like it's the Mac, but no, he's actually on an iPad and he can do exactly what you can do on the Mac. And I am pretty amazed by this, like in all of the best possible ways. Like this is so good to see developers, you know, already being able to just quickly, you know, put something together with the code that they already have. Um, and I'm just very excited to see everybody else do this as well. I do hope Grammarly does it. Um, I'm not a particularly huge fan of how they do things on iOS at the moment. Um, but it it is um, great to see, uh, hopefully that, uh, you know, it'll be much easier for developers to give people the same experience across platforms. Absolutely. Um, I'm sharing in the Slack really quick a link so we can show this video. I just this was the the tool that the person had that Simon had made um yeah. like earlier this week, uh on yeah. June 9th, had already created this tool that let you uh customize websites using CSS. And I it's important that we show it because a lot of people don't know what CSS means, what that can do. So I just want to show this if you're watching. Uh, so he's changing the background to purple in the settings. And then when he reloads the page, the background is purple. So you yeah. can imagine that uh, you go to a website regularly and you just don't, it's hard for you to read or there's something that you don't like about it. Watch this. He adds an animation that changes the background uh, so that it actually animates between colors. That's an easy example, but think about changing the text size on a page or uh, making the text more readable. Uh, this is a really yeah. cool tool that gives you more power over different uh, web, web pages. Yeah, no, I've, I know quite a few friends struggle to actually read uh, white text on black backgrounds. Like a dark gray background is fine, but a pure black background with white text on it is actually uh, seemingly quite hard for accessibility. Um, so I'm working on changing some style sheets on my own sites and so on there. Um, but for you know those people who frequently encounter websites like this, but like dark mode overall, they can just have it in one of those, um, which will do this and just change that black background to a really dark gray. Um, and I'm I'm really excited to see what other people come up with as well. I'm not surprised that Simon has has done this. He's the creator of Data Jar, JSON, J A Y S O N, and Scriptable, which are very nerdy, excellent tools uh, for iOS. Um, and JSON is on the Mac as well. And I think he said Data Jar. He's working on getting it over to the Mac. Um, so uh, fingers crossed, we'll see that uh, later this year. Nice. Uh, up next, Wallet. So with Wallet, there are some quick changes here. Um, Apple is working with, uh, it's kind of doing what folks are already doing, different states in the United States in particular, but elsewhere with digital IDs. So in states that support it, you will be able to add your driver's license or state ID to Wallet and use that to display in the different places that uh, support that. So this is really early um, in most places and digital IDs have a whole host of concerns as well. Um, we're not going to get into that here. It's just talking about the feature that exists. And then um, they've also added a new way to... It's interesting because technically this technology in a big way already exists for the home. Uh, if you have a smart lock, for example, um, depending on the smart lock you have, they'll have settings that let you, as you approach, it authenticates with your device and then you're able to open the door to your home. Uh, this is now built into Wallet. So you can, using your HomeKit connected lock, uh, use the Wallet app to activate and access your home, but they're also adding it to hotels and uh, workplaces in some ways. That technology will be out later this year. And of course, that's going to depend on who is supporting it and who is not. But uh, being able to check into your hotel and access your room all from your phone and just use your phone instead of losable keys is quite nice. So I know I would love that because anytime I stay at a hotel, I have to remind myself 15 or 20 times, don't forget to take the key with you. Don't forget to take the key with you. Don't forget to take the key with you. And then I will you know, put one in my wallet and then I'll forget what the room number is because it's not written on the mm -hmm. card. It's only on the envelope. And uh, that is always a, a struggle. So having that built is, into- And they get the wiped so great. easily as well. Like you put them next to other cards or something, even without MagSafe on your phone, they get wiped super easily. So I'm really glad. I of course have just installed two Yale locks on my, on my house. Actually, I, I've installed one of them. The other one just arrived like yesterday um, to, to install on my front door. Um, oh, nice. But they, they're using the Z-Wave modules. So maybe I can just change the module out and uh, be able to do that. On the other hand, my smart locks seem to work really nicely. So I'm pretty happy with that. But it would be nice not to need like 
the Yale app or something to, to be able to open them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it, we're going to see what happens here. I'm hoping that this is going to be, uh, as useful as Apple make it out to be. I'm hoping that my, my soon to be new car is going to have an upgrade so I can open it with an app. That'd be really cool. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but Hey, at least it's keyless entry. <laughs> Um, all right, let's uh, move on to the next segment, uh, which is live text. And I was hoping, Rosemary, you could tell us about live text, uh, live text in photos, live text in camera, live text, live text translation. What is happening with live text in iOS and iPadOS? So I actually had a use case for this earlier today. I went to the post office, I posted a parcel off to a friend, um, and they gave me the receipt with the tracking number on it. Is there a barcode on the receipt to scan it to like open the tracking website? No, like it's just a number printed on the receipt and it's pretty small font. And so, you know, I would open up, say, you know, the deliveries app or parcel or whatever and try and type that number in. But that's, you know, it's a bit fiddly to do. These are long, like 16 characters. You're going to make a mistake or you can now um, on um, on your iPhone or iPad, um, if you tap into a text field... Uh, you should be able to, and my iPad is, of course, not showing this. So I'm just going to switch over to my iPhone, which is not a, there we go. Uh, and uh, there we go. Um, and so now if you tap into a text field or something somewhere, then you can say text from camera. And I am now just realizing what a poor choice cleaning my desk was, uh, Micah, because I don't have anything with text on it around here. Wow. Okay. Oh, there we go. I have an empty envelope here that came earlier today from the DVLA. So they are, they're the people who handle like car text and so on. Actually, I've got a keyboard. Let's just try the keyboard. Um, so if I do text from camera, then it replaces the keyboard on my phone. Um, and you can see here, it's trying to find stuff. Okay. So it's doing a pretty good job. Um, actually, I think, here we go. I have uh, uh, dinner plans tonight. Uh, I'm, I might not get this subway deal, but look at this. That that There we go, right there. Insert text. That says wow. footlong sub meal deal with crispers 719. And for proof for everybody here, this that is, is the original That is exactly voucher. what it says. It is exactly what it says. It even recognized the capital letters. I am so impressed with this. Like this is incredibly useful for many reasons. So you can insert text from your camera, you can select text in photos and so on. But this is also really useful if say, for example, um, you, you want to have a look, you know, you want to copy something out of a picture. So I've seen developers using this with the WWDC keynote videos, like they'll take a screenshot and then they're using text from video to copy the code, which is such a good idea. I am so impressed with that. Like this is this is why like these people are smart people, um, but I've got an example here uh, on my iPad, um, and somebody posted this tweet. And uh, so, for people who are watching at home, um, then they might not be able to tell. Um, this is a, a picture of Bart Simpson, the opening credits from The Simpsons, where Bart has to write lines on the board, and it's always something funny. In this case, it's I must not install bases on my main device. This is a very good piece of advice for all of you. Uh, unless you're near mica. But look, I just selected, must not install betas on my main device. I will copy that. Switch back to drafts, uh, remove that word and paste. I have this text right here. I just copied that out of a picture. There was no typing involved apart from command V. Um, so just this amazing. is genius. Absolutely genius. Um, it's a great feature. Like you can actually like when you take a picture of a place, it'll like recognize the, the sign. Um, and everything, which is always really useful because one of the reasons why I like taking pictures of signs and so on, Micah, is because this way I can find it on a map. I've got yeah. map data. I've got date and time information about when I was there. Um, so, you know, I can be like, oh, I don't know. It was like in March 2015-ish, I guess, that I was there. And I can type March 2015 into photos and it will come up with all the pictures I took in March 2015. It's brilliant. Um, and now, you know, I will actually be able to search for the name of the picture there as well. So at the moment, at the very least, it's not going through and indexing all of my previous photos, um, which is uh, kind of a shame. But I, once you open it, it will then index it and look for text in it and save that text in the metadata of the image, which is brilliant. Um, so this is 
This is wonderful. Um, I can imagine, especially for students, you have to quote things out of physical books. Um, you know, people, you know that the library has physical books and they're not always online. Um, so I use that uh, to your advantage. Um, get quotes that other people aren't using. Um, but, you know, now you don't have to like type it up yourself. You can do live text. And because your your Mac can insert things by using your your phone's camera, then you can use live text from your phone and just stick it on your Mac um, if you're if you're doing it on there. Personally, I love using my iPad for this. Um, but wow, this is just brilliant. I am impressed with live text. So impressed with live text. Yeah, it's uh, incredible. Um, we have more to cover, if you can believe it. Uh, and we will uh, continue on after these messages. This podcast is supported by AT&T Active Armor. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. All right. Welcome back to the show. Um, up next is kind of an extension on <clears throat> the live text feature. This is more computer vision stuff. Uh, it's called visual lookup. So it we were talking earlier about how Apple in some ways is kind of getting parity with other companies. This is a lot like Google Lens, which you'll hear people mention. Uh, so great to have this on iOS as well. Um, photos will, you can, the app will, or your phone or what, what device you have will automatically recognize different things on the web and in your photos, and you can learn more about it. So the example, one of the examples they give is uh, you pop open a photo of a dog. It you can tap on it and learn more about that dog in particular and uh, know kind of what breed it is based on what the computer vision thinks uh, it might be. So really easy to see some information there uh, to discover more about what you're doing. Um, next one is Spotlight. Another quick one. Essentially, things are a little bit more rich uh, in search results. So if you type in um, an artist, for example, um, let me type in Lizzo and do a search. Um, Okay, it doesn't appear to be ready yet on uh, the beta because as I'm doing this search, it's not um, doing the new feature. But uh, we can show the examples that they give. So Billie Eilish, uh, they show Apple and Billie Eilish are besties. And so it tells you more about them, the music, and you can find that. Uh, if you type in a contact name, it'll give you a lot more information right there from uh, the the spotlight thing, which I am very happy about. I've got to tell you, oftentimes instead of when I'm trying to remember a contact detail, I don't uh, swipe down and type the person's name into contact into um, Spotlight. What I've done up until now is type in the contacts app so I can launch the contacts app and find them in the contacts app because that has the information that I want. Whereas it was not the case before. With this, you get a lot more information. If you are sharing your location over Find My, then you can see that there. You can see their current focus. Uh, so it shows Allison Kane is busy at the moment, which is really neat. And then um, you can also search for photos right from within the uh, spot, right from within Spotlight. But also, if other apps support integrations, then you can find photos in there too. Um, so do you want to say I just want to interrupt a second, Micah, because uh, it is actually already here. It's just not as immediate as you might think. So if I type, oh. for example, queen, uh, which I've managed to spell wrong, so I'm going to try that again. <laughs> uh, so uh, queen, then, you know, you can see it's coming up with a whole bunch of things here. So I had the word band. Um, and now I have this ah. rich result, um, including links to like Instagram and Twitter where I can listen to them, etc. cetera. Um, and if I type uh, Billie Eilish, um, then you can see Billie Eilish here is an artist, but in the search results, the very first result has got this little gray icon next to it, which for, for people who don't have amazing eyesight has got a microphone in there. I did hold the iPhone right next to my eye to check it. And when I tap on 
that, then I get into this really lovely rich result. Um, and this now matches what we can see on that Apple uh, preview page. Uh, because if you look closely, then you'll just see that Billie Eilish is like a little bubble in the search bar at the top, which means that you have opened one of the search results to see this, um, which is pretty nice. I would open your contacts app, but I don't want it to show, or your contact, but I don't want to share all of your details with everybody. Thank you. Um, so uh, people, people trust me, it does indeed work. Um, one thing I can try, which they've got is uh, photos San Francisco, because I have photos in San Francisco um, and I really can't spell today. Uh, I'm going to blame this on my thumb. They need um, to add Lizzo. Is, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm having a moment here because look, I uh, type in Lizzo. I typed in Lizzo band. I typed in Lizzo artist. I typed in all these different things and Lizzo was not one of the, the things there. So uh, Apple, that get is, on it. That is frustrating. Um, I'm very concerned. Apple only seemed to found three photos for me in San Francisco. Oh, wait, that's because photos are in there twice. Okay, maybe now if I do this. No. Oh, yeah, there we go. I have way more photos now in San Francisco, which makes a lot more sense because I know I have lots of photos in San Francisco because that's where I met you for the first time, Micah. Um, so there we go. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm pleased to see it is working as we expected it to. Um, and, uh, yeah, Spotlight is improving, which I think people will appreciate because this is kind of part of Siri um, when Siri goes, I found some web results for you. You're there going, really? Really? <laughs> Like, do I need yes. web results for this? Couldn't you have just told me that Billie Eilish is a famous artist? Like, you know, give me info. Uh, we'll quickly breeze through this next thing in photos. Um, memories is a feature that you may be familiar with. It was, uh, it's it's in photos already and it lets you uh, sort of take your photos, put them together in an animated kind of video with Ken Burns effects. Uh, but in uh, the next iteration, there are even more powerful features. You can add uh, special filters. You can add music from Apple Music, which is really nice. And it's uh, be timed and everything. Uh, so it all comes together to make a better memory that you can then share with people. And they're interactive. So you can you know move forward in the video or photos, move backward, and kind of set things up exactly as you want. Uh, in health, uh, there are quite a few updates. So we'll, we'll quickly touch on some of the things, including health sharing features. So uh, imagine that you are the caretaker of, you, say you're a parent, and you also have parents. Uh, so as a parent, you uh, give your kids um, Apple Watches, and that is collecting some uh, data on them that you want to be able to have access to. And then as the caretaker of uh, your parents, then you also want to be able to uh, keep an eye on their mobility and be able to um, be able to make, you know, uh, make informed decisions based on uh, different health health uh, results. So all of that can be done in the new version of health. Uh, what's super cool too is new trend notifications. So uh, over time, it is using all the data that it's collected um, per your permission to start to give you information. So it'll tell you about like if you're sleeping more or less over time, uh, if your resting heart rate has increased or decreased over time, um, if you if you do uh, track your blood glucose levels, if that's trending high or low, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots with the health app. We'll include a link um, in the show notes that has even more information about what's changed um, in the health app. But that's kind of a, a quick over overview of that. And then um, in privacy, uh, I think this is a really cool thing. Uh, so up to this point, we've had um, a privacy report for the way that uh, devices, that, that, um, what, what is the, the current privacy report? Now I'm blanking on it. Uh, but let's just say this. In uh, iOS 15, there's an app privacy report. And what this does is it gives you information about how apps are using the data that you have. So this is based on permissions that you've given them. So whenever you first launch an app and it's like, hey, uh, do I have access to this? Can I have access to that? Can I have access to this? This is permission that you've granted. And then it shows you how they're using those permissions. It's also showing you uh, what third-party domains they're sending this information to, meaning what sites and servers they're sending this information to, and how recently they sent that information. So you can get a quick look at, uh, in the past seven days, kind of how your data is being used. 
And then from there, make informed decisions based on that data. So I think this is a super cool uh, new feature that is available that lets you uh, get a quick privacy report um, that will show you uh, what, what's going on. So I turned this feature on yesterday and um, it should start recording that today. Uh, it is not yet uh, set up. So we'll see kind of what that shows you. I think, Rosemary, I'm curious, this could be a good and a bad thing because it's important that folks know this is stuff that you have granted permission for. And my concern is that people yeah. may not at the beginning sort of understand that. They're thinking that maybe this information is being taken. So I hope that uh, everybody does a good job of explaining what the app privacy report is. Yeah. I mean, usually like Apple say, you know, when, when, as a developer, when you ask for context information, tell people why you want the context information and what you're going to do with it. So, you know, there's already structures in place there to try and make this better. And inside of the privacy tab now, you can, you know, tap into say contacts and you can say, oh, I don't want if this and that to be able to access my contacts um, or, um, you know, where do we do that can't access my contacts? Actually, that can I have a nice birthday widget with them. Um, but then when you tap down to record app activity, you need to toggle this on and then save it. Um, and then you can you can see all of this information um when it actually you know happens later, um, which is is a good thing. But yeah, um, you know, I, I'm I'm a little curious as to um, what is going to happen here. They, you'll also notice they have improved the language here. Allow apps to request to track instead of uh, uh, the, the previous uh, slight bit of blooper, which made people think that apps just wouldn't have to ask to uh, track them. Um, but um, uh, what I'm a little concerned about here is these uh, third-party domains, um, which Apple are now, of course, going to report to users that apps are talking to, because there's a lot of reasons to talk to third-party domains. So say, for example, um, you allow, uh, you have a book reading app and you allow users to choose from a variety of custom fonts and you don't ship those fonts inside the app. You allow people to select one and then you download it to their device from a CDN. People who don't know what a CDN is, it's a content delivery network. You might have heard of that term recently because Fastly had a major outage this week and they are a huge CDN. And things like fonts are often stored there because that way they, they can be stored locally, geographically. So there'll be one in Canada, one in the US, one in Mexico, one in Australia, one in the UK, one in Germany, et cetera, um, which means that you know the data doesn't have to travel physically as far, which makes it faster usually. Um, and uh, you know, so people tend to like storing things in a centralized location, but that might mean that they can't register that URL as local if they are using, say, for example, you know, the hosted version of that instead of uh, their own storing it themselves, which would increase their costs. So hopefully uh, Apple's going to allow like, you know, app developers to add tags and stuff to this. I've not had a chance to look at the documents there. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think overall, this is going to be a good thing, including the, the mail privacy um, and offline Siri, which we will be getting as well. Yes. Um, let's uh, go ahead and move on to the next uh, sec. Oh, that I was like, why can't I find that? That's because I was still in um, the health stuff. So um, that that covers it on iOS. There's there are some other features that are there that you can check out. Um, some extra stuff that we didn't get to, uh, but we should talk about the stuff that's on iPad OS uh, that is not a sort of feature that's on iOS. So a lot of those things that we covered um, at the beginning, especially, are things that are available across the different platforms. Uh, but on iPadOS, there have been some updates to multitasking. Do you want to talk about those, Rosemary? Yes. Um, so for people who remember the before times, multitasking on iOS was interesting. You'd open an app and then you'd swipe up to reveal the dock and drag something else into view, things like that. It was a little bit crazy. It felt a bit weird. Multitasking has improved in many ways. I'm just going to switch to my iPad here. So again, I've got the drafts application open. And at the top, uh, if you have amazing eyesight, you should just about be able to see three little dots. And I'm just going to mouse over to that. Um, and uh, then when I tap on it, it comes up with this multitasking view. And then I can say, okay, put this on the right half of my screen, like 50% or just a little bit. And if I do just a little bit, it's folded it mostly out of the way. 
Um, and now I can, you know, scroll through and I can look and I can say, I want shortcuts as most of my other screen. And then it's now a popover view, which is great. Um, and then I can tap this and I can say, no, make that 50%, please. Um, and this just means the multitasking is a lot more accessible. In addition to this, now I've got two applications open. I can see the three dots in the top middle of my right-hand application have got a little gray bubble around them. That means that this application is active. And if I type, things are going to appear over here. I'm apparently very good at typing lots of nonsense without spaces. But if I then tap back over here, that bubble's moved. And so when I'm typing and thinking things aren't appearing, it's because it's on the left side. And I just need to take a quick glance at the top to know which application has my focus. And um, when I say my focus, I mean the focus of my keyboard and my mouse uh, if I'm using one of those with this. Now, as I demonstrated before with this automation, you can also split screen apps with shortcuts, which means that you can just do this automatically, which is great. Um, and I'm just generally very impressed with the way this works now. Of course, you can still drag things out of the dock and put them somewhere. Say, if you hold it on the bar, then then it will you know, go into slide over. If you put it on one of the sides or the other side, then it will gray out that background um, and let you know it's going to replace that content it's working incredibly well. We haven't lost things like, you know, the ability to do that little swipe up and swap between applications um, in, in our little slide overview. Um, but the fact that, you know, they've, they've significantly improved things here, they've made it automatable. So you can't just, you don't just open an app now, you can open an app and another app and something in slide over all at the same time. Um, and uh, of course, we even have little floating windows if we want to take notes with them as well. Yes, uh, that is a very cool feature. And in fact, um, we'll talk about that in just a second, but uh, widgets on the home screen is huge that we can, literally huge uh, in some cases and also just huge in general. Uh, we love that you can have all of, uh, like iOS, that the I, that iPad OS finally has that feature um, and then being able to tuck away some of your apps into the app library. Uh, but let's talk about Quick Notes because this was a feature that I was really excited about. I think that it is one that suddenly gives... Um, uh, As you can see, it's, 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 it's not data. perfect just yet. It's, uh, <laughs> it's crashed. For me, I'm going to try that one again. It works better if you're in an app. I've noticed a lot of bugs uh, on the uh, dashboard, but if you open it in an app, it works really nicely. It's very solid, um, which is good. People carrying know. around a tablet with them suddenly, you know, just sort of loose makes a lot more sense when you've got this. If I'm walking around, yeah. I've got my 11-inch iPad Pro or 11-inch iPad in my hand, quickly swiping open a quick note and taking that note, jotting it down, um, having this be able to be used in different apps, this is also a great way on the iPad to do research because you can pull in mm -hmm. links, um, add handwriting, add uh, notes and tags and mentions and all these different things that will come together uh, to give you context of what you were researching at the time. And then on... Uh, uh, in the notes app, you'll be able to view all of your quick notes and on uh, Mac and iPad OS, you'll be able to make edits to those. So um, it says, if you make a quick note on your iPad, it'll be available to view on the iPhone and the Mac, uh, but editing it, you know, is uh, available on iPad and Mac. Uh, and yeah. So yeah, it's it's great. It's it's I as I said, I think that this is one of those things that really sells the idea of sort of having an iPad in hand and being able to use that stylus for something. As uh, someone who's not an artist, uh, this yeah. is one of those things that I've wanted to use the stylus for. I should make a note that if you are walking around and you're holding your iPad um, and you're in the lock screen, and this is something you've already got if you've got iOS 14, if you just double tap with the pencil then it opens straight into notes for a quick notes capture. And that's a feature that's existed for a while, but this is incredibly useful for the uh, the time that say you are on a, a great website. Uh, I've got one open right here. Oh, look at that, iOS today. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, you can see I've actually got a little note there, but I'm going to create a new one um, or try and create a new one. What is happening here? I don't know. There we go. I can create a new note and then it's got like the URL and everything up here and then I can tap add link. And then if I go into say podcasts and I look at something else and go, oh yeah, I mean, there's really great podcasts here. Let's say it's Smart Tech Today with you and Matthew Castanelli. I want that one as well. 
then I can add multiple links and so on and so forth. It's, it's really lovely the way that that, you know, just integrates and slides over and it's right there. And, you know, I can always get it back later if I want to. Uh, and in the meantime, I have widgets and it's telling me that I need to watch Ted Lasso season one, episode three, which I've already watched twice. So I think uh, the, the TV widget might be a bit broken at the moment, but that's okay. I'll allow it. Uh, then we'll also mention that Swift Playgrounds on iPadOS has gotten a huge update uh, that involves being able to code and publish apps to the App Store. This is a big thing that I know had a lot of people gasping uh, that you'll be able to submit apps to the App Store right from the iPad. Um, so yeah. folks can take advantage of that. And I, there's, you know there's going to be excellent marketing around, I made this app completely on iPad. People are going to love that. Oh yeah. Yeah. People are absolutely going to love that. Um, and one thing I will say for people who are going, oh, this is going to get me on the public beta. This is, if we get a beta of it, it's going to be a separate beta, which may only be available to developers. Usually uh, applications like Xcode beta and so on are usually only available to people with a developer account. Um, I can't remember if the free developer account also gets those, um, but at the moment, Swift Playgrounds is exactly the same as it has been before. We've demoed it on the show. It's just got the, the same uh, learning and, and books in it, basically. Um, uh, it doesn't have the ability to develop applications. I am keeping a very close eye on the Apple developer site because I cannot wait to get my hands on this uh, and really dive into it because I think it's going to be a great way of showing people how wonderful the iPad truly is. Uh, I think the only thing it can't do is create an Apple Watch application, but it can create iOS applications, iPadOS applications, and macOS applications as well. You can even use UIKit with it, not just Swift UI. Um, so this, this is going to be pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, I'm also excited to see what might happen with changes, uh, to, um, standard Xcode projects and so on, because I think, you know, with many of these things, we're going to find out that, you know, Apple have found this great way to put this on this device, but they've had to make some changes for it. Then those changes can often filter back into something good on another device. Not always, but frequently. So let's cross our fingers there. My fingers are crossed for sure. Um, and yeah, that covers that on... Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. One last thing that we want to cover with iPadOS, which is universal control. Mind-blowing. Uh, it is the ability to, <laughs> to use your iPad and your Mac. Uh, and well, okay, three different devices between iPads and Macs. Uh, which for Rosemary makes sense now that she's got three, uh, two, two different Macs there and an iPad. And you can use one keyboard and mouse for all of them. And so yeah. uh, it was really neat seeing Craig Federighi uh, display this feature where he was able to put the three devices next to each other and start, uh, I think it was on an iPad, taking a photo that he had just finished editing and take the, the trackpad to pick up the photo move it across the iMac in the middle of the, the setup and then bring it over to the right to a different Mac and drop that photo there as he needed to or vice versa. It doesn't uh, matter. It went across gosh, yeah. three devices and this yeah, I mean, just going through the one in the middle was showing off. It was Exactly. Just yeah. Oh, wow. So it's really cool how this feature works where, you know, you're not having to do a bunch of setup to get this. And it's, so people are like, but I thought there was a sidecar. What sidecar does is it lets you use your iPad as an external display for your uh, Mac. And so all that does is it gives you another screen. With this, it's actually keeping iPad OS as it is and letting you interface between the two. So it's a step up from something like AirDrop where you're dropping photos and videos from the iPad where you can actually just move between them seamlessly. And we'll see if it works seamlessly. Uh, Universal Control is not in the first betas of, um, of Mac OS Monterey. Uh, so it's not yet available to take advantage of, but hopefully we'll see it in beta two um, or soon so that we can give it a go because I really want to try this. I think it's such a neat thing uh, that lets you switch between these devices and uh, it, it's going to make all the difference. Yeah. W one little caveat I should mention is from what I've read, this has to be initiated from the Mac. So that means that if you've got a Mac and an iPad sitting next to each other, uh, they don't actually know where the other device is physically located. So if you put your iPad on the right-hand side of your Mac screen, it only knows if it's on the right if you then start going with your trackpad on, on your Mac off to the right, and then you just kind of keep going. And the first time you do it, 
um, I think the best way to describe it is like going through like, um, I don't know, syrup or something where, you know, usually if you think of your trackpad gliding along, it's like it's gliding through water. Um, but then when you get to the edge of your screen, you just try and keep pushing it. It's kind of like it's going through syrup and then it pops through. Um, mm-hmm. And then it works on, and then it, it can just go around. And then after that, you can then use say a magic uh, keyboard. Uh, that's the one with the built-in trackpad on your iPad to also control your Mac. Uh, but you have to start it from the Mac. Um, but wow. Yeah. Like this, this bit that we're showing on screen right now, which is where it gets a little stuck. Um, like it, it's going to slow down a bit first to make sure that you, you know what you're doing. You've recognized you, you're not just like swiping to another space or something that no, you're trying to go off your device and onto another iPad. Um, and I've, I've heard that this is going to work with a lot of devices. Um, so I'm very excited to, uh, to see what happens there. Yes. Um, all right. Well, let's briefly mention some of the things in watchOS. Um, so watchOS 8 is going to give you better access to photos in general. Um, there's a new mode that it's, or there's a new feature where you can use portrait mode photos on your Apple watch. It was funny because Apple on stage said, Hey, um, the Apple watch face is more popular than any other watch face for watch OS. And Leo and I were both kind of surprised by that because we, as kind of nerdy folks like to use all of the different complications that are available on some of the other faces. But as Andy Anako pointed out on, um, I believe it was Andy, uh, on MacBreak Weekly, the reason why is because, and my partner is one of these people, that's what made me go, oh, right, is that people use the photos face in order to do custom watch faces. So they can kind of make it look like it is how they want to. Uh, but with this new feature, it uses the depth data of portrait mode to do kind of a magazine style look where the person's face is in front of the time. And you can scroll the digital crown to kind of zoom in and zoom out on the person uh, that is layered in front of the time. So that's a nice, a nifty little feature, plus the ability to share photos right from the watch app uh, in messages and mail. That is... Um, understandable given that Apple is doing its best to give people the ability to just use a watch on its own that has cellular pairing. So for uh, kids with the, the new family mode uh, version of, of watchOS, it's no surprise that they're trying to make sure that folks can use an Apple Watch almost like an iPhone when it comes to those basic tools. Updates to the home app on uh, watchOS so that it's easier to control devices and see information. All of the wallet features that are available on iOS are coming to uh, watch watchOS, which makes sense. Um, and then it will be able to take advantage of the ultra wideband chip to unlock your uh, car or other thing, depending uh, based on, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Based on uh, the supported stuff. And then what I really like is that messages gets an improvement where you can use all the different types of um, composition methods instead of just having to choose one or the other. So I can dictate a message and then I can quickly uh, scribble, which is the the little on screen using my finger to type a message and emoji all at once. So instead of having to choose beforehand, like I want to dictate this message or I want to use scribble to write it out, all of it is available. And then you can use the digital crown to very easily and with with good um, precision get to the part that you want to fix. Uh, They've also added the app hashtag images to uh, Apple Watch so that people can respond with GIFs, which is great. And then you can share music. The focus features are coming to Apple Watch uh, that are available elsewhere, which makes sense. And then um, Breathe, which was the way for you to do mindful breathing, is being renamed Mindfulness. And instead of just featuring Breathe, where you breathe in and breathe out uh, over a period of time, they're also including uh, the ability to uh, reflect is what the new app is called. And reflect is a way, it'll give you a little message like, Think about the good things that happened today, except they're a little bit more, they're a little bit better than that. And so then you'll take that period of time, not breathing, but instead being mindful and, um, you know, uh, thankful for whatever it happens to be. Uh, So those will both give you mindfulness minutes as points. Um, With the Apple Watch, you can track your sleep respiratory rate, which is a great feature because uh, if if that trend changes, there is likely a reason for that. Um, our respiratory rate s- tends to stay the same over time when we're sleeping. And so if that changes, it can be 
early information about uh, what is going on there. Some new workouts, including Tai Chi, uh, which is awesome, and uh, Pilates, and uh, that takes care of that. There are some other, again, as usual, some other features that you can check out uh, by going to the page, um, including one that I did want to mention, which is that the always on display can be taken advantage of by more apps than just the Apple watch face. So if uh, you have like a weather app um, that you were looking at and you sort of put down your wrist it can go into a low power mode, but still be available on the screen. So you can quickly, if you know, you thought that you read it, that happens to me sometimes I will like launch a thing and then go to something else. And it's like, wait, I purposely opened that app to look at something, but I completely spaced on actually looking at the thing. So you could still see it even whenever it's uh, on, it's always on screen. So that takes care of watch OS. Um, there's lots to check out there. Um, but other than that, um, the other features are heavily related to developers, so we won't cover them on this show. Uh, there is but... one little thing I want to mention that oh, we haven't talked about yet, do. Micah, which are related to AirTags. Um, and there's now a new notification in Find My when you leave one of your devices behind. And I actually tested this out yesterday, and unfortunately, it appears I've wiped my notifications, so it's not there anymore. But uh, I left my house keys in the car while I went into into the supermarket uh, to to buy some stuff. Um, um, and I got a notification as I walked away that said, hey, you left your house keys behind because they weren't at home. If you leave them at home, then it's it's not going to notify you. I haven't dug around yet too much into, uh, you know, specifying when it should notify me and things like that. I've not played with it at all. I just took my house keys out of the house with me, left them in the car because I don't need the house keys in the supermarket, of course. Um, and uh, it works. Uh, I'm really pleased about that because uh, I've, I've not, I've, I've rarely left my house keys behind, but having a notification to tell me that I've done it without a subscription, thank you, Tile, uh, is uh, definitely a selling point for me. Nice. Yeah, that is a really cool feature. Uh, all of You can set it up too with your um, iPhone and all of it. So uh, you don't have to leave anything behind, which is really nice and completely sells AirTag for me more than anything else has. Uh, the yeah. tracking was great, but what I really want it for is that reminder of, hey, you've left this behind. That I Now I have to get one of those little custom things where I can put it in my wallet and uh, it will let me know if I've left my wallet behind. It's perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've just um, opened up Find My right here and you can see notifications. There's notify when left behind and it defaults to accept at one location, which is at home. And it's just got my town listed here. Um, and you can, you can toggle this off for one of your devices. So if you don't ever want to be notified when you leave one of your devices behind, um, then that's fine. But you can also add like new locations. So you can, you know, pick something. Um, where you can, you know, just choose something. So say, for example, I never want to be um, notified when I leave it right here in the Mended Pills in Cheddar, uh, which is down the road, then I can I can add that as well. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, good. I like it. Very pleased about that. All right. Um, we will move on to one quick news bit before we round things out with feedback and our app caps. So one quick news bit. Uh, folks, we just wanted to follow up on last week's episode where we covered all of the finalists for Apple's, uh, Apple's Apple Design Awards. Um, six uh, categories of apps were, six choices were selected across uh, different categories and uh, those have been chosen. For inclusivity, it was the app Voice Dream Reader which we talked about as a way to do um, text-to-speech translation across all sorts of different digital media uh, and physical media too with um, the ability to do OCR. Um, for the uh, inclusivity game, it was Hollow Vista, which was this really neat AR style game where you could use the, the camera was in completely built within the game, but you sort of could move around in physical space and capture photos of different things and talk to people. It was a, a really fascinating um, game to play that was beautifully done. In Delight and Fun, the game that won was Poc Poc Playroom. Uh, Poc Poc Playroom was the app that basically had lots of different little toy box games. So a really neat feature there where you could take advantage of uh, different uh, toys. And then 
Uh, Little Orpheus, which we talked about as this beautifully designed game, uh, also won. It's a platformer that uh, lets you play and follow this really interesting story that took place. In interaction, our pal Carrot Weather uh, took out the win there. And Carrot Weather is a delightful and sometimes ridiculous uh, weather app that I love and use across all my devices. I know Rosemary enjoys as well. Uh, happy to announce that Bird Alone by George Bachelor and Friends uh, won the award for interaction due to its unique uh, and sort of, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Minimalistic uh, interactions. I love my bird, Oswald, and uh, I check in with him every day now. And uh, we hang out and write songs and poems, and it's just a sweet app. Uh, in Social Impact, the app Be My Eyes uh, won the award. And this one we talked about is for helping people with lower no vision around the world. You can um, volunteer. They can pop it up. And the example they give here is somebody can say, hey, what color is this shirt? You can help them figure that out. Uh, Alba was the game winner which um, lets you save local wildlife. We talked a little bit about that game um, on the show. Uh, really cool. For visuals and graphics, Rosemary's app, well, the app that Rosemary talked about, Luna, which is uh, great for you know falling, uh, falling asleep or mindfulness moments uh, as you wind down at night. And then Genshin Impact, which we didn't cover much on the show. It's a big game, uh, but it is very, it's clear why this app got... Um, you know, one of the awards because it is really well designed. Uh, as it says, motion blur, shadow quality, and frame rate can be reconfigured on the fly. Uh, so you can see all sorts of, uh, take advantage of the, the powerful iPad uh, processors. For innovation, Naad Sadhana uh, won for its app, which uses Core ML and artificial intelligence to um, help you create music along with uh, whatever singing or, or performance you're doing. And then League of Legends Wild Rift, um, because it says it takes a complex PC game and delivers its full experience on mobile. So to actually be able to play uh, this full-on League of Legends game right there on mobile, they were very impressed with. Um, so yeah, those were the winners and congratulations to them for their wins in the Apple Design Awards. All right, Rosemary Orchard, my voice is about to give out. So I am hoping you can lead us into the feedback segment. Yes, indeed I can. It is time for Shortcuts Corner. This All right, so... Here. All right. So in Shortcuts Corner, we talk about shortcuts and we answer some listener questions. And nobody actually sent this question in, but I sent this question in. So I'm going to talk about it. And that is what's new in shortcuts in iOS 15? Because of course, Apple don't ever just leave these things alone. Shortcuts has got some changes in iOS 15 and it just crashed on me. This is the life of living in beta one, people. And this is why you don't install the first developer beta unless you are a developer beta or have a or have a very good reason to talk about it. So uh, overall, to start with on the surface, things haven't changed hugely. This is my iPad uh, on the iPhone. Uh, you, you just have a list like this. And then if you swipe over it, then you'll, you'll get into your list. Um, but uh, where things have changed a little bit is actually inside of the app view. I'm actually going to go ahead and create a brand new shortcut here. So to start with, the shortcut name is now at the top and that's editable. This previously wasn't. You had to go into like a little info view um, to do that, um, which, oh, that's you know, wonderful. details kind of I like this. That. So now... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really hated that as well, like changing the icon and so on. That's all done right here when it works. Let's just pretend that's fine. Um, and uh, I don't know what this phone... Oh, this is a random government phone number that I phoned today. So that's not important here. Um but you'll see here at the sidebar, which is the 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 draw that you pull up on on your iPhone, is um, very different. Um, so it's got some next ac um, action suggestions. So I added an action just by selecting it over here, and then it's saying, "Oh, hey, like after you've listened to your most recent voice memo, you might want to choose from menu," and it suggests this. And look. Micah, the choose from menu is now a little bit different. Uh, oh. Instead of it just being this list, it's saying like, this is item one, this is item two, item three, and so on. It's it's just 
a little bit more helpful, let's put it that way, uh, when it comes to these things. So we still have the same categories for actions, um, but we have some some changes. I'm just going to remove some of these. So for example, open app, I can select to open an app. Maybe I have to tap on the screen. Clicking doesn't do it. So I could say open Apollo, but this little arrow over here next to Apollo is what was previously a show more section. And now if I toggle this down, the open app can open in slide over. So if I run my shortcut, then it should, voila, it opens Apparently, I was searching Skincare Addiction UK for sprays. I was looking for an SPF spray earlier today. That was it. I uh, saw so one recommended. So, um, you know, this is, you know, there there's some tweaks here, essentially. So some things have changed. We've got some new actions as well. Um, and there we go. I've managed to remove that. So we can set a focus mode. So we can say, uh, set uh, walking the dog. That was a custom one I created here earlier. And you can say on until a specific time, I leave, an event ends, um, and then you can select the specific event. So you'd have to check your calendar first for that. Um, uh, and of course, you know, you can just say until say, I don't know, 10 p.m. or whatever, because it's almost 9 p.m. So if I turn that on now, then it would turn off in three minutes. Um, but what's more important are things like low power mode, which was previously an iPhone exclusive is now available on iPad OS and Mac OS as well. So you could say have a focus mode, which is for uh, some fairly intensive activity that you usually do. Um, and you could turn on low power mode as part of that, which is really cool. Um, I, I really like this. Um, so there's there's quite a few uh, little things which have just sort of changed and tweaked. Um, uh, you know, with, with iOS 15. Um, so a lot of these icons are now a little bit different. Um, and also you'll see things like vibrate device will appear on an iPad and a Mac. Well, you can't vibrate an iPad. And if I run this, it'll just say, Hey, you, you can't do this. That's not possible. Um, and with, you know, apps being available on, on more devices, what you are probably going to want to do, um, especially with shortcuts, because you're going to find that some apps have got different shortcut actions on different devices. So Things has a separate iPhone and a separate iPad app. Well, now, if you want to run, say, uh, I don't know, an, an action that is in an app that's on iOS and macOS, then you're going to need to probably check what device it is. Um, but you can use this little uh, action here called get device details. Um, and uh, I'll just add that right here. Uh, so you can get the device model. Uh, and I'll just get rid of my little vibrate a moment and just check what this is. So it comes back with iPad. All right. And then you can say if underneath this and if the device model is iPhone, then you could do one thing. And if it's you know, if it's a Mac, you can do something else, et cetera. So, you know, there's going to be quite a few ways to work with this and really benefit from it, which I think is really nice. Um, they've also got a few little changes in, in here where on my iPad, I can easily say, hey, uh, I want this shown on my Apple Watch, please. And I want it in the menu bar on my Mac. And I want to be able to use this as a quick action um, and things like that. Um, and there's also some setup options for import questions added to the home screen right here, show it in the share sheet, et cetera. Um, and now there's also a change where you can say, hey, if there's no input, then I would like to stop and respond, ask for input or get the clipboard. Um, and so you can say then ask for photos. So now if you try to run a shortcut that needs a photo and it doesn't have one, uh, it's not going to let me do this because I don't have an action here anymore. Uh, I'll just add a few draft and there we go. Uh, then I can choose, oops, you can see I was uh, sorting out my braces earlier today. Um, so I could go ahead and say, okay, yeah, I need to choose a picture and then, uh, yeah, it doesn't do that. Um, so uh, yeah, there's, there's some tweaks, but I think the most important part is that short, shortcuts is also coming to the Mac. And especially with focus mode, people are going to want to open applications when focus mode starts or close applications, things like that. And that's all stuff that you can do now with shortcuts, which is really exciting. So uh, yeah, I'm pleased to see that this is getting more and more powerful. Um, 
So for today's Shortcuts Corner question, it actually comes from Joseph in a club twit in the Discord. That's not the only way to send us questions, though. Um, and Joseph said, wondering if there's a way to disable notifications when I'm doing my workouts. App opens and then resume when I'm done. App is closed. The workouts are full screen videos and my pop-up notifications prevent me from see what, seeing what's going on. Well, Joseph, I completely sympathize. That is very frustrating. Um, and this is something you could do with a focus mode in iOS 15, but I'm guessing you're probably going to be a smart cookie and not install iOS 15 right now, like we've been telling you uh, for this episode. Um, uh, but there's still a way you can do this. So in the automation section in shortcuts, and you're going to want to do this on the device that you usually do workouts on. So I'm going to guess that this is probably an iPad. So do it on your iPad if that is the case. Um, and then tap on the plus to create an automation and choose create a personal automation. Then scroll down and you're looking for the option app and you just want when this app is opened. Okay, so you can you could go ahead and look. Um, for whatever reason, Fitness Plus is not on here. So I'm just gonna select Instapaper as, as a stand-in for the time being. Um, and then tap next. And then we just want do not disturb. And I'm just going to search for this. Now I'm on iOS 15. So it's saying set focus. Just it do not disturb is exactly the same action. And you just want to turn it on until it's turned off. And that's it. You tap next, make sure to turn off, ask before running. And that's the start of this. So now whenever you open the application, do not disturb is on. And that's good. Turn off your notifications. And then we need to create another personal automation for when your app is closed. Make sure to uncheck when the app is opened. Otherwise, we're going to have two things running at the same time here. Um, and then select that same application. You could choose multiple applications here as well, by the way. Um, and then I'm going to say, do not disturb, uh, which is for me setting focus. But for you, it's going to be exactly the same. And then you just set it to off. That's all you need to do. Make sure to turn off, ask before running. And now if I open Instapaper, it's turned on Do Not Disturb. It didn't even come up with a notification because I'm on iOS 15 and I'm already in Do Not Disturb. But now when I exit it, the Do Not Disturb icons just disappeared up in the top right. That's that's all you need. Um, so that is how you can do that. And this should stop notifications coming through. Now, there is a little thing that you might want to check in settings and you can see why I had Do Not Disturb on. So I'm just going to turn that back on myself. Um, and that is under notifications, uh, I believe. Um, I'm having a blank moment at the moment. Micah, maybe you remember. Ah, sorry, it's probably under... Uh, do not disturb. It's going to be a little difficult to show you this because I'm on iOS 15, but there's an option for notifications to um, come through anyway when you're using your device. You're going to want to turn that off on your device in the settings for do not disturb. Um, I think this is probably now um, buried somewhere in here um, for um, for various uh, options, but um, on on iOS 14, it's definitely something along the lines of the, like make sure that the notifications don't come through while Do Not Disturb is on. Um, but there we go. Uh, that's how you can do that. So Joseph, let us know if that is working for you, and uh, I hope that we have helped improve your workouts so that you can fully engage with them instead of being distracted by whatever people are sending you or whatever emails are coming through. Agreed. Agreed. Um, all right. And then what, uh, what do we have left here? Well, we have two pieces of feedback, including one piece of feedback, which has come from Chris, who sent this in via email. You can still send us email, everybody. Um, so uh, it's about the home app and the home pod. Um, he said, Micah and Rosemary, wonderful how you've moved the show forward with your own styles. I used to be a solo watcher of iOS today, but my husband has caught on to why I seem to keep up with all our devices and he's watching your show with others and me, uh, with uh, and others with me. Good company. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Chris, for letting us know. And uh, I apologize also for assuming your gender. I don't know who you are. Anyway, you sound lovely. Um, so Chris says, we've been getting on with a lot of the latest things and we are keeping an eye out for pros to come. I had purchased a HomePod Mini for myself and hadn't been concerned with including it consciously within the Home app. However, we decided to add a HomePod while there was still one available and I put it in our common area family room. I set it up using my iPhone and it works fine. My husband would like to use it as well, but our music tastes are not always in sync. 
I do subscribe to Apple Music and we do have family sharing. I can't figure out how to add him to the HomePod so he can play his own stuff. Some of our devices seem to be there, but it doesn't seem like all the stuff is there and I can't find where to add him. If you've added, if you've covered this before, please save the work and point me to this episode and show. Otherwise, <laughs> wow, can I use the help uh, with thanks from Chris? Well, uh, this to me, Chris, sounds like uh, something is probably automatically set up a home at, uh, home instance on uh, his device, which is a separate home. Um, and so I'm just going to open up the home app on my iPad here uh, and give it a second to load. Um, and uh, switch to it. That's my iPhone. There we go. Um, so here in the home app, if I tap on the home, oops, there we go. If I tap on the home at the top um, under, um, you might so for some people see multiple different homes. Um, and this is probably the problem. Okay. So now here under home, you can see I've got Queen Square and Chepstow closer. Just two names. One, one is where I physically am. One is where I'm not. Um, and these are two different homes. Now it's entirely possible that your husband has another home. Um, and if he does, then you're going to want to delete that home and invite him to your home. Uh, because uh, basically what's going to happen is there's two homes at the same geographical location and they're warring with each other, essentially like, no, me, no, me, no, me. Like think of toddlers. Both of them want the slice of cake. Um, that is exactly what iOS is going to do. It's not going to know which way you need things to go. Okay. So I'm just going to switch to the kitchen, which is fortunately one of my rooms with the least number of devices. And here you can see my home pod as well. Um, and gotta love these betas. I have zero information other than what was recently playing. Oh, there we go. So I just need to scroll a long way down. So you're going to want to make sure the HomePod is set to a room. Um, and um, you, you, you can then make sure as well um, that you can create a stereo pair here and so on as well. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, then there's music and podcasts and there's primary users, okay? So there's a HomePod account and um, a me. So I'm, I'm just going to use me here. Um, and you can say that it'll update listening history. So this means that if it doesn't understand a personal request, so for example, if somebody, a guest in your house asks it to play, I don't know, the best of Queen, um, then it's just going to, tack that onto your, your listening history. Um, but if both of you have got personal requests turned on and you've trained Siri to hear your voice, then your, your HomePod mini should be able to, uh, listen to both of you and play music for both of you and assign it to each of your Apple accounts. Now you said you've got family sharing, but you're subscribed to Apple music. If your husband doesn't have a subscription to Apple music, um, then you may find that, uh, his choice is limited um, to, you know, whatever he's already paid for through Apple Music. If you've got something like Apple One or Apple Music with the family plan, um, then that won't be an issue and you'll you'll both be able to listen to everything, providing, of course, your husband's been added to your account, Chris, um, which I presume you've already double checked. Um, but one thing that I would recommend you check and then please email us back and, and let us know if this worked is can your husband airplay from one of his devices to that HomePod mini. Because if he can't airplay to that HomePod mini, then I have a sneaking suspicion that you might have a router that's got two networks on it, a 2.4 gigahertz network and a five gigahertz network. Um, and it, the HomePod mini is hopping between the two of them. Um, and if it is, that basically causes weirdness. I don't know of another way to describe this other than weirdness. Um, and uh, so you need to make sure that both both of you have got Hey Siri turned on on your your iPhone or iPad, um, and that it's learned your device, uh, your learned your voice. And I apologize for triggering everybody's devices by saying that, yeah. but that that is the name of the thing that you need to turn on. I'm not going to say it again, but look for that particular feature. Make sure it's turned on. Make sure it's learned your voice because then it knows which person to assign what music to. Because otherwise you're going to end up with a bunch of weird stuff in your listening history and it's going to affect suggestions and recommendations and you, you don't want that. So make sure that that's set up. Um, make sure that you can airplay to the device. If you can't, check that it's not hopping between networks. Rename the networks on your router to be the same. Trust me, it should be fine. If you have a problem with a device, then uh, it, it, it's going to be solvable almost certainly. Um, just set the networks to the name and then let the router say, 
this device plays on five gigahertz, this device plays on 2.4 gigahertz. Routers are usually very, very good at figuring this out. Um, if it's still not working, I would try resetting the HomePod mini. Um, this can be a bit tricky to do. Apple have got uh, support documents for it. Um, but basically just in the, the home app, scroll all the way to the bottom. There's a reset HomePod option. I am not going to go all the way through with this because my HomePod <laughs> minis are working just fine and I don't yeah, really so want to set it all up again. <laughs> but if you can restart it, actually try restarting first. Uh, try restarting the HomePod mini. You could try pulling the power out and then plugging it back in. Um, but you can also just restart it from the home app, which means that you can be nice and lazy and not actually have to physically move. Um, but then if it doesn't work, remove the accessory, go through setting it up again um, and make sure that the home in the home app um, if you pop into the home and then go to home settings, make sure that you are listed as the owner of the home. If you're the one setting it up, if your husband is the owner of the home, it might be worth having uh, your husband set it up um, instead and seeing if things then work, uh, because that that's probably quite useful um, to to you know give it a, a try if nothing else works. But please let us know uh, what worked for you and what didn't work for you, and if you're still stuck please tell us. I would love to solve this problem for you. And I think uh, Patrick, who's on the Twit staff, has got the same issue uh, with uh, his wife. So uh, yeah, it would be uh, great to solve this problem for many people. Agreed. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing back on that one. Um, and then one more here uh, from Wonder Warthog who asks, is there a way of blocking unknown messages in the Messages app? I'm getting scam text messages. I opened one just to see what it was, and it was, a, it was an invite to some not-so-great content. Yes, I know better, but I wanted to confirm what it was before entering it into uh, Haya's list of nasties, which Haya is an app that does the spam, um, spam reports. Uh, but... I don't want to see them to begin with. I only get these on messages, not in Telegram. So Wonder Warthog, there are a couple things here to understand. Um, depending on your service provider, uh, your, your mobile carrier, there are different ways to go about fixing this. Um, the only one that I know about um, for sure is uh, AT&T because that's the one that I'm a part of. And so let me find this again really quick. Uh, I'll type in AT&T block email text. Um, it's AT&T Armor who are active Armor who are sponsoring the show today, I believe. Well, that also helps. Um, what you can do is you can call um, AT&T. Um, a lot of times these messages are coming from an email. And this is the most annoying thing because if it's coming from an email, it may or may not uh, be blocked. So what you want to do is if you're on at and you can call and say, hi there, uh, I've done some research. Can you please look up article 446389? And when they do, they will see uh, a tutorial that walks them through how to block getting email text messages sent to you. And that in many cases, has taken care of the problem for a lot of people. Uh, but from there, you can also take things a little bit farther. The, the thing is that this feature does not completely block these messages. It just sorts them into a different area. Um, so what you'll do is you will launch the settings app, and then you will go into messages, and then you will uh, scroll down until you get to... Um, where is it? Unknown and spam. And then you choose filter unknown senders. When it does this, it will filter them into their own section and keep them away uh, from your main text messages. But it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't, doesn't completely get rid of them. So if you're AT&T, you can use that. Uh, I have some friends who are on Verizon and Verizon doesn't have an article, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and whenever you call them to have them block texts from emails, it doesn't always work. And then I can't speak for places outside of the US, but um, do you have any other yeah. tips besides those, Rosemary? I mean, I've personally had some good luck with those call blocking applications, which will, uh, you know, do things like uh, block phone numbers. They also tend to block text messages. Um, and you said you're using Haya, uh, Wonder Warthog. Um, so um, I, I, I would double check um, because there is, uh, I think you might need to look in the phone settings. And of course, I'm looking at this on my iPad, so I can't see it there, um, where... Um, 
uh, you can then uh, turn on the, the the filtering and that should apply to text messages as well. Uh, it may not, but uh, it's worth giving it a try. Um, and one thing I will say about the filtering unknown senders option is for me, uh, if they fall into the unknown senders, I then don't get a notification. I see a badge on the messages app, um, but I, I I don't know about it until I see that basically, um, which works pretty well. Uh, personally, I have had to turn off um, like blocking the un withheld caller uh, number. Um, and I know some other people have had to do this. My doctor, whenever they call me, they come through as withheld, uh, which means if you don't know that that's going to happen then you and you don't turn that feature off, uh, I had to walk my parents through turning it off as soon as the, the pandemic hit because uh, I realized that otherwise they were going to call the doctor. I have a phone appointment and never actually get a phone call because it would just be filtered and disappear. Um, and honestly, uh, places ought to sort that out and just call as a, a public number, um, mm -hmm. as their outgoing number, because that would fix many of these problems that they have. The doctor's surgery had a thing on their website going, please turn this feature off. Um, and uh, so, uh, the, yeah, that clearly people have been been struggling with this, but something like Hire ought to have an option for filtering. I'm not using Hire myself at the moment. Um, but uh, have a dig around and see if you can you can find um, an option to turn on automatic filtering uh, because they already have a list of nasties. Um, uh, so they they ought to be able to uh, to find um, things like this and do the automatic filtering for you. You're not the only person saving these things. Um, so uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, agreed. All right, folks, that brings us to the app cap segment. So let us put on our hats. We've uh, gone quite quite far in this episode of iOS today. So we will uh, place our app caps upon our heads. Of course, this is the part of the show where we honor our app picks of the week by wearing fun, silly, uh, interesting caps. And uh, this, we share apps that we enjoy that are maybe new to us or that we've had for a long time that we just want to share with all of you. And so Rosemary, tell us about your app cap and then tell us about the app that you picked. Well, my app, uh, my cap today is what I have worn before. It is a Viking helmet made of plastic, not metal, because otherwise <laughs> this would be very heavy. Um, and it's it's therefore much more malleable and therefore comfortable. And my app pick of the week is Scorecard. Now, Scorecard is an app that is a, a $5 one time app purchase. Um, and it is for scoring things, in case you hadn't guessed from the name. Um, so the idea is that this is for scoring games. So you could use it for scoring things like Scrabble. Um, I was recently having a very intense game of Phases 10 with a friend um, and that was great fun and we used this app to score it. So you start by giving uh, your the, the name to um, an app um, or sorry, to a scorecard and then you can add players. So I could add say Micah, uh, that's spelled incorrectly, but autocorrect fortunately got me there. And there we go. Let's add rows. You can also have teams um, and you can put people on a team together, uh, things like that. So Micah and Rose are now a team um, and I can, you know, team details. I can, you know, add people to it. I can remove people from it um, and uh, so on. And uh, yeah, this is a pretty good way of a scoring game. So I'm just going to actually remove uh, myself uh, from this team. So we're now not playing as teams. So I now have Scrabble um, and it was started today. And then I can add sessions. So this is really nice if you've got, you know, games that maybe go for multiple sessions. Maybe you can't finish everything off in one turn and you want to just keep uh, keep notes uh, for things. So, um, you know, I can add a, a player to the session as well. Um, and I will just add uh, both of us here uh, because uh, it was set up as teams before. So in each session, you can have players and then... Um, you can just, you know, keep adding uh, scores to things um, and, uh, you know, do that. Tap in, uh, you know, once once you've added your points, you can give it a moment and then it just adds that up automatically. It rearranges players automatically based on, you know, the number of points. Um, so you can select a winner. Micah, you've won. You got 11 points. Yay. There's a confetti of emoji. I love it. I can, I can change things. I can, uh, have rounds to this. Um, you know, I can 
add more people to the session if somebody joins a bit later. I can even airplay this. Um, so I can't do it at the moment, obviously, because I am uh, plugged in to share my screen. But, you know, if you have, say, an Apple TV in the corner where you're playing an intense board game, you can airplay the score on screen so everybody knows that Micah is winning in Scrabble. <laughs> um, and uh, then I can say, actually, no, Micah, you're not the winner. You're losing your crown. I have got another 12 points. I have got 19 points, which means I'm going to select myself as the winner. And voila, that is scorecard. It's very simple, very easy to use. Um, you can you can have multiple games going at the same time. Um, there's there's a couple of options in the settings, like you can change the the scoring uh, sort um, and you know share share the application basically. But it's by Lickability who makes some some really great uh, really great apps um, and. Uh, you can uh, see as well for each session, you know, who's done things. And of course, you can also replay a session if you want to. So if you've got the same people every single time, then you can just hit replay. Um, and then uh, you'll know for each session, you know, you can see R is first here and then M is first there. And I can just go replay that one again. And uh, tap if you if you tap uh, just... Uh, um, on the score, sorry, I should have mentioned uh, this. This could be very useful. I say, for example, you're playing D and D and you're you're trying to keep track of people's characters. If you if you want to add, say, like three times thirteen times eight, um, then you you can do that and you know save that. Um, I'm not quite. Oh, there we go. Um, I will just uh, remove that one. There we go. And then you've got 104 points, Micah. I think you win. Um, Yay! I don't know. Maybe I'll just change that. There we go. I think I win now. <laughs> that's fair fair <laughs> enough um well we weren't right. really playing a game when we do i will make sure to score accurately excellent that is as you said scorecard point tracker in the app store um i am going to be saving uh my the app cap that i had for next week because i want to talk uh, very quickly about something that uh, i just saw to this morning pop up if people are seeing uh their friends and family as Pixar characters, and they're wondering how that's going, how that's happening. Uh, there is a Snapchat filter for Pixar characters. And so this is my app cap this week. You can download Snapchat for free. We'll include a link directly to the filter uh, as you have to activate it. And then you too can look like a Pixar character, which apparently this is what my Pixar character would look like. And um, I'm digging his eyebrows. He's got pretty cool eyebrows. Uh, but other than that, I'm a little creeped out. I've got to say, uh, but that, that, that folks is my Pixar character, uh, which you can find again in uh, Snapchat, uh, as, as a filter. So I like what it's done. It's really accurate to my nose, which is really fun. Um, yeah. I like the way that it's not just changed like your head. It's also changed your clothes and everything and your hat. <sighs> That's really yeah. good. I might it's actually have cool. to download Snapchat. Yeah, j literally just for this. So everybody can post their uh, fun Pixar f uh, photo. So yeah, we like I said, we'll, we'll include a link in the show notes that lets you basically when you tap on it, it launches it directly in Snapchat. And then you just tap um, OK to activate it for 48 hours and then you'll have access to it. It's called Cartoon 3D, but we all know it's, it's a Pixar character. They've done Disney characters before uh, and others. So yeah, that's how you get to that one. Folks, that brings us to the end of another episode of iOS Today. Uh, you can ask us questions by emailing them to iOS today at twit.tv. We've gotten some great ones. Um, you can also tweet them at us at uh, uh, by tweeting with the hashtag ask iOS today um, or message us in the discord the discord you say what what is that well folks uh, you should check out club twit twit.tv slash club twit where you can become part of the club for $7.99 a month you will get access to uh, all of our shows ad free which is awesome plus uh, the twit plus bonus content. I always say plus as I start to say it, which has outtakes and some other fun stuff that you wouldn't get elsewhere. And then what is uh, obviously the most popular part, uh, access to the members only Discord server where you can chat with us hosts and producers and also hang out with uh, one another in the club. All for, I said $7.99, didn't I? I meant seven bucks a month. All for seven bucks a month. I apologize. I'm so used to the dot .99 on everything. Seven bucks a month, twit.tv slash club twit. Check it out to join us. 
Uh, and we would love that. And of course, we appreciate your support. It means the world to us. Um, you, if you'd like to hang out with us live as we record the show, just go to twit.tv slash live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. But the best way to get the show is by subscribing to it by going to twit.tv slash iOS and clicking to subscribe in the various formats, audio or video on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube, et cetera, where all the places that you want to be or many of the places that you want to be anyway. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? Uh, the best place is rosemaryorchard.com, which has links to all the things I do, including this podcast and two others. Um, and also you can follow me on micro.blog and Twitter with the username Rosemary Orchard. Micah, what about you? You can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Folks, thank you so much for joining us this week and for sitting through quite a long episode of iOS today. But look, we had to cover all the stuff at WWDC uh, as there was so much to talk about. And this is the show where we do that. So thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll see you in the future. Goodbye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are interested in checking out all things smart home and Internet of Things, then you should check out Smart Tech Today, the podcast I, Micah Sargent, do with my co-host Matthew Casanelli. It's all about the smart home and improving your automations. <laughs>